I recommend also be careful where you purchase stuff from. I thought I would purchase a smoker from eBay. Well, that smoker, when I got home, it did not last long. I got what I paid for. So you're gonna run into that. Um, another thing I noticed or realized, if you purchase from one company to another company, the parts not, might not work together. They sometimes adjust it just enough that it won't work together. They might tweak it like an eighth of an inch or something like that. So maybe that queen, the excluder on the front of the hive won't fit that hive box when you set it up. So just be aware of that. The parts don't always work. Okay, so we'll talk for a few minutes about location because you're going to have to put your bees in the yard somewhere. The best to, to have the hive facing south or east, the reason being is that that shines on the front of the entrance, it gets the bees up and moving and all that kind of things in the morning. North would be your last option. Hives need to be easy, easily accessible. A lot of people work from the side of the hive. You can work this from the side or you can work it from the back of the hive. Good morning. Good morning. So it's your choice, but you want to have, be able to have room around the hive to be able to work that hive. Not too shady of an area, but the reason being is that sometimes if it's too shady, um, I accidentally had two apiaries set in my yard. I placed my hives underneath the slash pine trees, which they had a lot of shade. I had nothing but problems with hive beetles, and hive beetles can be an issue. So I originally moved the hives over to the other apiary, and they're in much more of a sunny location. Um, sometimes you might want a little sun in the afternoon because at, at three o'clock it gets very hot. You know, you, it, they can handle a little bit of shade in the afternoon, but sitting uh, totally in shade all the time or, you know, they, they don't have enough sunshine, then it causes problems with pests. Good ventilation is another thing. You don't want it to be an area where the air current is not moving. You want to have, be able to have some sort of ventilation. Too much moisture in the hive or a hive sitting in an area that doesn't have good ventilation, it's going to also cause, you know, problems with uh, diseases and stuff like that. Um, no high traffic areas, you know, maybe there's a part of your yard that your dog likes to run around or you have children or whatever is such have you, I wouldn't put it in that area there because the bees are going to be out flying around, they're going to be bumping into people, they, they might get bumping into someone and say, hey, you're not, I'm not having it today and they might, it might take a singing incident on. Dry land is another thing, um, Florida does have very much rainy events where you can get, you know, four to six inches of rain couple inches of rain or very rainy season and then the area floods the problem with that is even if you have your hives up on blocks the ants are going to come up ants are going to come up out of the ground and then they're going to go up into the hives and you're going to lose your hives because they they don't care for ants and they're going to abscond and ants will take over because they like you know they like the brood area for protein they like the the nectar area and all that they're going to utilize that source for food so be, make sure you have a high and dry area. Water source is required by the state of Florida. And you want to have a food source as well. Um, it's very difficult to raise bees in an area that there's no forage. Um, another thing is if you actually, because you, you're, you're, you're utilizing the sustainability around you. Um, also, it can work against you if you get too many bees. If you have too many hives, it can work against you. Now they're all fighting for competition. So the best thing to do is look in your neighborhood, see, see what, the, what kind of forage is out there. What, is there trees and bushes and all that to utilize? Because if there's not no forage out there, then you're going to have to be feeding your bees all the time. So that's also a consideration. And just be aware, good morning, Hello. of uh, property lines. Property lines are a big issue. Um, your neighbors are running a weed whacker, a lawnmower, maybe they're spraying something along, you know, weeds along the path. The property line, just be aware that bees don't like ventilation, uh, vibration, ventilation, vibration, they don't like it, they don't like it, they will get set off. They, it can cause a stinging incident. They don't like it at all. Here's some examples of water sources. Someone asked me that yesterday. You can use any one of those. You can get um, a bird bath. You can use a, a dish like that up on the top, you know, from the bottom of a plant. Uh, a pot and put some kind of gravel or rocks in it even if you are a wine drinker and you you can float wine corks in there just something for the bees to land on um, if you have a little pond area some people have koi ponds or they might have a little you know 
water source in their backyard to set up some sort of a pond for enjoyment. You can use that as well. Yes. What if you have a canal next to your property? Um, technically, you can't count it. It's not a water source on your property. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, there's canals everywhere. Yeah. I mean, everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, that was, I was a. Just, just checking to see. Mm -hmm. I, I have a canal right behind my yeah. property. Yeah. So yep. They water. technically want you to have a water source on your property. Perfect. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. It's crazy, but it's true. Location on nine non agricultural colony situated within 15 feet of the property line needs to maintain a flyware barrier at least six feet in height. Parallel to the property line, such as fence, dense vegetation, and extends beyond the prop colony in each direction. Neighbors using landscaping equipment, like I said, vibrations possible make the hive get upset. All properties or portions of the hive it, where the bees are kept need to be fenced or an equivalent barrier to prevent anybody accessing. Um, if you remember as you were kids, you used to do some stuff as kids that you probably would never want to do as an adult. So. Yeah, just uh, fence it in. You don't want uh, um, someone's stray dog running up. You know, dogs are curious, pets are curious, people are curious, so they want you to have that area to be fenced in. Don't place the colonies within 150 feet of a tethered animal. Um, unfortunately, if you have a chicken coop and they're in a, you know, the run or whatever, they, they can't escape if, this, if the bees decide to, to take it upon themselves. Um, don't place colonies that it impedes or egress by emergency personnel. Um, I heard a rumor, someone said years ago, that there was a YouTube video out there, and I don't know which state it is or whatever, that someone put highs on each side of their front door on a uh, porch, and the fire department had to come to, to help for an emergency thing, and they could not access because of the beeps, you know, going off. I googled it, I could not find the video, so I'm not sure if there was just some rumor or not. So I, I tried to find it. Okay, yes ma'am. The, the 15 foot, if I have a 6 foot fence that encloses my, I have a city lot, so in, in a, but a 6 foot fence that encloses, so I don't need to, I can put it near the fence, not 15 feet away, is that a correct statement? You can, but just be aware of the closer you are to the, feet. yeah, <laughs> but the closer you are to the fence line, just be aware that your neighbors are really close. Yeah. Because I know there's a lot of people who are, they love to run the weed whacker once a week and they love to be out in their yard and they're running the mower or they have a landscaping company that comes in and does all that. So the landscapers could get stung as well, I mean. But yeah, that being real close to a fence can, can cause a problem. Most of my complaint calls are fence lines and swimming pools. Bees like swimming pool water, they love chlorinated water. So I'm just giving you, yeah. I wish I had a swimming pool, but I don't. I have a pond. But um, yeah, I mean, most people in Florida have um, screened in pools, but there are, I've been in areas up in Jupiter where half, more than half do not have screened in, screened in porch uh, areas for pools. So, but they like that swimmable water. Question. Yes. For um, agricultural land, is there any other types of rules, or these just don't apply if it's agricultural? Um, the tricky thing about agricultural, I, this is asked all the time to me. I even get emails. If your property is agricultural residential, like I live in Acreage, there, you know, it's considered agricultural residential. It only means, and I don't like the word because it's, they're using it in over here and over here. Um, it only means that you're allowed the opportunity to go to the property appraiser. They have a section that you can call them up and ask them, what do I need to have an egg requirement? You have to go to the property appraiser, ask what their qualifications are, what is needed to get an egg exemption. But that, the reason why I don't like that is because they're using the word term agricultural. If you are a property like single family, residential, or commercial, or whatever, single family residential will never be able to go to the property appraiser to get an ag exemption on their property. So the only term, the reason why I hate that term is because they're using agricultural. But if you're an agricultural residential, go to the property appraiser and ask them, how do I become bona fide ag? And then you'll get the exemption. Then your rules for the BMR, because this is a lot of this is for non-agricultural lands, they'll be more lax. They'll be more lax. Yeah. But like I said, it's I don't like that word because they're using it here and they're using it here. And it causes a lot of confusion. 
I had to learn about it because I got my property bona fide egg. So I did it years ago. But it doesn't matter, like, as far as fencing goes, when it's, like, agricultural, you don't need to have it. I still fencing. use the practices because I do have neighbors near me. I make sure I have a water source out. Um, I put I put a poultry net around my fence, and my my um, hive is from the back. You can't see from the road at all. I've planted it so much that I take the opportunity to plant native plants to help feed the bees and to out of sight, out of mind kind of thing, because you know some public are scared of bees. And um, so I put up a poultry net. You can just use four stakes. Go to the big box store, Home Depot, Lowe's. Go in the garden section, you get those gar those garden stakes that are about three feet. Drive them in the ground. You can buy poultry netting, put it around. I like it because I have a lot of problems with frogs. You know, you got the bofu frog, the bofus and all that. And if they get near your hives, they're just going to sit there all day and eat. They, they are at that entrance, they're going to be going. And sometimes they'll be stacking on top of each other. You'll see four or five frogs. come, And they'll be just having a hay day. And you'll, you'll be losing your foraging force so fast. So I use it more towards keeping the frogs out than anything. So, but I, that's what I use it for. Yeah. Because um, the frogs are going to find your, your bees. Yeah. How far does the vegetation or fence have to extend beyond the column? I would probably go, you know, four or five feet because a lot, sometimes the bees like to, they zip from the fight if the nectar source is going that way. You know, they're going to go that way. Wherever they're going to go to go get the food stores or the water, that's where they're going to head. So they will have a habit of going. And the reason why they're saying the hive thing is because when you have a hive, they go straight out. They don't go up. So it's forcing them to go up. So if you have a neighbor next to you and they like to use their backyard and you have that six foot fence, it's forcing them to, to go up and not directly over like, okay, now we're in the neighbor's backyard. You know, they're heading straight towards it. So that's why they say a six foot barrier. Or you can use really dense vegetation. But the problem with dense vegetation, you know, if your neighbor has a dog out running around, the dog might be able to get through the vegetation. You know, uh, you know the dogs are, you know, dogs are dogs, right? So you always have to be very aware of how, how they can infiltrate that, that in vegetation. And that's a loose term as well. I mean, how do you define dense vegetation? You know. Your uh, perception of dense vegetation might be different than my perception. So that's kind of a iffy term on times there. All right, hive stands, hive stands, and hive stands. There are so many ways you can do hive stands. You can purchase them, or you can make them, or you can just use what I use as cinder blocks. I like cinder blocks. I don't like to use wood because, you know, in Florida, wood just gradually gives out. It rots. You know, it does all kinds of things. Um, I have more of a, this here, I don't have this bottom piece, which is an option. I just have the block sitting like that, and then my hive sitting up there like that. Some people put them on the roll like that there. The only problem is, if that, if that gets kind of jiggly, you might be working that first hive there, and it's, it's bouncing the other hives, and then the other hives will be, might get riled up a little bit, because they're sitting all on the same, the same thing there. I kind of like this here. But I think that's a lot of work. <laughs> it almost looks like you know a decking, decking type of material. Do, do you tip your hive support a little bit for the wedge or something? You can. I mean, you can stick sticks or rocks. I don't. I have. I run screen bottom boards. Oh, gotcha. So I've always. That's my preference. Um, the bottom one. It looks like that's one of those ones that you can purchase. It came from probably Carolina Honeybees. It's on their website. There's some more hive stands there. Um, yeah, you can even go, so this is a hive stand you can purchase. They even look like this, which I think you can, that almost looks like you use it for in the office equipment. Um, and then they have the plastic. And I'm not sure how well plastic holds up in Florida. You know, the, I mean, it's a very high. The one on the right, you can self-level it. It has the Yeah, the legs, spin, the legs you move, right? The disc yeah, you can adjust the legs. Yeah. Yeah, which is kind of nice if you have an area that you're trying to deal with all the time. Okay, bottom boards, and there's always the big discussion about the screen bottom board and the solid bottom board. And then there's the variation here. You can purchase it where it has the, the ramp coming up in here. And then they, a lot of times on the screen bottom board, there's the corrugated thing, and that's used too for varroa counts to see what drops down, and you can use that as, as a measuring tool for your varroa. Um, I, like I said, I use screen bottom boards. It's my preference. 
Right, because that gives me the advantage of the sun, using the sun and it's nice and warm out there and I'm not dealing with so many hive beetles or whatever, but it also gives the bees a little bit of relief from the heat. So that's kind of my trade-off for that. <clears throat> a lot of beekeepers won't use screen. They like the solid, solid bottom boards. So that's all by your choice of what you decide to use. Then there's the discussion about eight and ten frame boxes. <clears throat> and that, you know, that, that can play a factor there. So you have your ten frame, which is nine and five eighths. That's the big, the, they call it the D. And then you have the eight frame as well. Some people like the eight frame because it's a little bit lighter, a little more manageable. Some people like the ten frame. So that's all, you know, all in what you decide you want to work with. Unfortunately, the boxes won't change, so if you start using one, you can't stack that on the other because it's going to, you know, of course, leave a gap. So realize you're going to be committed to a certain size, or unless you buy two entirely different things and run two different types of equipment. Then you're going to need foundation. Some people do run foundationless hives, you know, foundationless. There's techniques of how to attach it to a frame. You have to do some reading. Some people put on popsicle sticks to get, get them to draw. Um, there's a, you can use chopsticks to get them to draw. Some people, they cut a strip of the plastic foundation, they'll cut a strip across there to get them to draw without, without a foundation. But the most um, popular is the yellow or natural and the black. Now the white has just come out recently. I don't understand it. Because to me, it would be very hard to see anything on a white frame. The eggs are white, the larva's white. I don't know how popular it is, but now it's starting to show up in the magazines, in the catalogs and all that. So just be aware. The black frame is the easiest. If, you're, if you have a hard time seeing eggs, the black is actually the very easiest because the eggs are white. You can see the little, the little eggs on there very easily. I've never experimented. Go ahead. You use the white for the super. Okay. Like deep. But they're using they're using them in deeps as yeah, well. I know it doesn't that, that make makes sense. No, that makes no sense. It don't. Honestly, God, I like I said, stay away from the white. I don't understand the logic. And like I said, it's popping up in all. Oh, it used to be just sporadic, but now it's popping up and everybody's selling it. And I'm like, okay, wired. I've never experienced wired. Um, it has its own set of dilemmas in that. You used to be able to, years ago, create wire. You'd have to run, run spools that have holes on the side. They had a different technique. This one's vertical, but they had where you would run spool the old-fashioned way. It would go this way. This here, I'm assuming, is a sheet. It probably snaps into the frame just like that. I'm assuming it's just wired. It snaps in, and that wiring gives it the strength. But we realize in Florida, Wax gets very pliable, so if you have a um, frame with no foundation in it and you're doing your inspection and you pick that up, and you've got to be very aware of how much attachment that the bees have attached here, because if you take that frame and tilt it this way, it's going to go, all the wax is just going to literally fall, and you're going to lose your entire, your entire build of honeycomb or comb on that frame, because wax in the heat, it gets very, very pliable. Very, you know, just, it's almost soupy. So you have to be very careful. I use foundation, but like I said, that's another discussion. Some people don't at all, some people do. It's whatever you decide to do. Then there's the wedge frame and a groove frame. I've never experienced wedge. I go with the groove. I feel it's easier just to snap the foundation in. This here, I had found this document. It talks about the tiny cut makes the frame a wedge top of the frame. The wood can be snapped off. So these two pieces must snap off. You've got to snap those off and reassemble once the foundation has been added. To me, that's just too much work. <laughs> that, that, that was so, in a class yesterday. Okay. Snap, snap it off and use the wired wax. Okay. Fit it in and then put the Yeah, piece to me wax. that's just too much work. <laughs> I've always used groove. Groove, you just snap the, snap the foundation in right on in there and it's, it's easy. Yeah. He's probably, you're right, I'm sure they use, they have to use it. You could probably use there. the foundation in that, but you could probably only use, like you said, the wire in this. Right. You probably, you can't snap the wire into that. It would be, you would have a mess. It wouldn't be that pliable. <laughs> that pliability would not work. So, yeah. And a lot of times, if you look at the catalogs and all that, they have instructions explaining 
You know, they kind of, they're very good about spelling out things for you when you're reading. Okay, you buy this, this works with this, this with this, and this with this. So they're very good at explaining it. So you don't accidentally like purchase the wrong thing and then you're like, now I have a whole box of this and what am I going to do with it? So. Feeders, um, yes, once in a while, as you talk about, there's times in certain locations in Florida that are very, very tough at times. There is not enough forage for the bees, so you might have to venture into feeders. Um, I have the, I actually have all three of these. This is the one you kind of want to stay away from. Unfortunately, it is the cheapest one, but the problem with that one there is it can cause a robbing, a robbing problem at your entrance. Uh, because the bee, the robbers can go directly in here, access, and then go around this way. Why this sits inside the hive, it's taking up the space of, of the frames. There's different size ones, there's like one, there's one, one and a half gallon and two gallon. So it's going to either take one or two frames out, it's, it's encased, it's inside. This here sits on top of the box, and it's just like an additional thing that sits on top. And then when you're ready to feed, you just pour the lid off, you pour your syrup in here, or you pour the syrup in there. That one there, you gotta take the jar off, unscrew it in that. You can kind of bypass this if you put a block over here and make that entrance real saw, small, but it might not stop them from robbing if the, if the uh, forage is like down to zero. So be very careful using the, the board bin or the entrance feeders. Which one do you prefer? I, uh, actually, I got frame feeders. I use those a lot. I figure they're the easiest. I've tried these, they're okay. I've got a couple in the shed, they're okay. Is it a seasonal thing, like a, a time of year where they're more, I guess you're feeding um, bees? Certain areas, it can even be in the middle of the summer. I know like for instance, Jupiter, Florida, they, they gotta feed the bees up a lot up there. So um, where I'm at right now, I've had to feed now for the past few weeks. I've never had to feed where I'm at before. So unfortunately, I, weather it plays a big role. It's like raising any livestock or crop. It plays a big role. And I think because the weather's been flexing so hard back and forth, it's causing bloom times to be off and it's causing other things. So my bees were doing good. I, I, I started feeding weeks ago. They looked like they were holding. Then I had to go work the state fair. I came back, I checked them this past week and I'm like, oh, gotta go back to feeding again. So, and I'm, you know, I walk around my yard, I'm checking what's blooming, what's not blooming, what's going on. And I think the bloom times are off horribly. Yes. And how do you know if they're hungry? There'll be no, no, food, in, no food in the um, frames. There'll be no nectar in there, no honey. And you'll just know. And they'll have an attitude a little bit. The bees will be cranky. Like we're hungry, we're hungry when we're, we're cranky when we're hungry, the bees are too. So. Is there a list somewhere what we, sh what we could do to help them by planting certain plants? Because um, I, I heard in the class yesterday there are certain plants, natural plants, that yes. they, they will forage then it's not good for them. Um, is there a list of those and list of good things to plant? Well, most likely if you Google, Google out there, there is, um, uh, let me think of some, firebush is a good one. Mm -hmm. Let me see. I got Bahama strong bark. It's a small tree. Fiddle wood. They actually can forage off of uh, red tip cocoa plum and horizontal. Everybody uses those sometimes for shrubs. They actually, they actually can forage them off those. Uh, what else do I get? Wild coffee. Wild coffee is a Florida native. Saw palmetto, of course, because they make honey off that. Uh, the what else is in the yard? Any tropical? Jamaican caper is another one. It's tropical fruit native. trees. I'm sorry. Any tropical fruit trees they like? Yeah, you can star fruit. Star fruit's a good one. Okay. Yeah. Um. Let me think. Of course, orange trees. Uh, you know, but I have a they, lot of fruit trees. So yeah. Avocado. Mango. I've heard stories that they like mango, but then I've heard stories that they don't like mango. I'm seeing them all. So over my, it's. My neighbor has I think them. if they're desperate for food, they're going to try the mango tree. <laughs> they're, they're if there's enough the food, tree. they don't try the mango tree. Yeah. I keep right. hearing flip flop about mango trees. Yeah. I do. They're on it now. My neighbor has probably 20 mango yeah. trees. Yeah. And I think because them. there's not enough forage, they're they're going to try the mango tree. Yeah. Don't know if they're getting anything off it, but they're checking the blooms. Um. Uh, let me think about anything else I can think. Sunflowers, simple mm -hmm. as that. Right. Um, it's in the yard. Spanish needle. Crabwood, yeah, Spanish needle is the Florida name that everybody eats. Crabwood is a tree. Um, <coughs> is 
that black ironwood? Black ironwood? Oh, necklace pod is another one. That's a Florida native. Necklace pod is a bush. Black bead is another one that's a Florida native. Gets to be a bush and it blooms flower. Um, Walter's verbenium is another bush. That it's blooming right now. Walter's verbenium I got in the yard. Oh, let me think. I can't think of anything else. I'm uh, trying. I'm, I'm, I'm visualizing my yard as I'm talking. I can't write as fast as you. Can, exactly. So. <laughs> but there are yeah. There's a lot of them. Out. If you Google it, it, they're out there. But I'm always planting, so they yeah. try to increase. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I was going to ask on the, the top feeder. Is, yep. Is that way? There, is that how they come up through the yeah they can access up through that that is usually it's got a screen on it and, and then so they can't as yeah they come up there's an opening here and they come up through the up through the middle and there's a screen and they can't get like into the pool. once in a while they do oh. once in a while you'll get a bee that manages to get up there oh, yeah okay. and in fact all in, in this one too the frame feeder oh. this one here has uh, on those holes there it has this like ladder thing it's, it's a round thing, and they, and they, they crawl down there and go. Oh. Some of the frame feeders I see now that they're making, they don't use that top piece. And uh, the um, plastic has like this, it's slatted, so they can walk down it like a ladder and go and get the food there. But unfortunately, yeah, there are, will be some, that, some casualties there. Some casualties. <laughs> and, yeah. It's just sugar water, right? Like a one to one? Oh, uh, one to one. Yeah, one to one. Yep. Now they'll go to other stuff, right? I've seen them like at soda fountains and... Yes. Um, when we, they work the fair, they'll go to ice cream, soda fountains. Um, when I used to work for municipality years ago, we had leftover Halloween candy. Well, somebody decided to throw it in the dumpster. The next day, hundreds of bees in the dumpster after the Halloween candy. So yeah, they like that. I was at, did an inspection the other day, the, and I guess it was a dearth. And he had a big cast of bananas on his banana plant. The bees ate all the all the bananas off the plant. So it's I guess it's fair game out there. So does it affect the honey at all? Like well, there... you wouldn't be making honey. They're just using it to survive. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, if you start seeing weird colors in your hive, like a bizarre thing, that means they might have found something. You know, candy or a soda. And you're like, what kind of honey is that? Yeah, it will look it will look different. Definitely. Um, granulated just sugar. white granulated just sugar, sugar. Not, not raw sugar, oh. not nothing in it, just white granulated sugar. White yep. Okay. Yep. I think if you use raw or something else, it actually causes the bees to have dysentery, or I think it can kill the bees. There's something in there, just don't, don't use it. Yes, yes sir. One to one. Um, Exactly what is that? I mean, it's, it's the ratio, one to one. Yeah, one to one what? one, one well, like one I, if I'm making it at home, is it, a pound it doesn't have to be, it don't, it don't have to be like perfect. You know what I'm saying? So let's say you're, um, I'm going to use five cups of water. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to scoop five cups of water. I'm going to get close to four or five cups of sugar and put that in there. And then if I'm not sure, I taste it. Oh yeah, it tastes good and sweet. Okay. Like I said, the bees. Uh, if you're a little bit off, it's not gonna. It's not gonna matter too much. But, <laughs> right. Yes. Do you uh, do it like simple syrup? You cook it to break it down. Yeah, I warm it up, but don't boil it. You don't, don't want to boil it. I just warm it up just enough for the granules to be able to to break down. Yeah, do I mean, I use a microwave. Yeah. I just pop it in the microwave, boil my, get my water up warm, and then I'll mix it. You know, it's just about ready to boil, and then I'll cut the microwave off. Oh, yeah, and then I'll put the sugar in there, swirl it, let it dissolve, and then it's ready to go. Yep. you got to be careful when you use that down here, the one-to-one -one sugar. Yes. They're not eating it fast enough. It will turn rancid. It ferments. It, ferments it goes back. Fast. Yeah. So you've made this big batch. Yes. you got to take care of it. Yep. you got to make sure it doesn't turn on you. Well, and that's correct. I used... Um, because my frame feeders hold a lot, I only fill my feeders about that full. Mm -hmm. Which, and I figure I'll check back in a week. You said those are in multiple sizes. Yes. I, I got two of those one gallons yeah. uh, from Holly. But if your hive is not that big that? and you're putting in one gallon of syrup, it's going to take them a while to eat that. Right. So yeah. you, you got one gallon and you do half Yeah. Rate? Yeah. Because I have some hives that are not very big. Okay. And I'm like he said, I'm in fear of it. I'll be going rancid. Yeah. 
very yeah. quickly. Because Florida, I mean, we are all, you know, we're warm all the time. Yeah. So yeah, be careful. So I only I only filled mine that far, and I'll probably check it peak tomorrow before the rain comes. Yeah. Know, to see how how well they're doing. Okay. So the supers. So this is a, a shorter box. There's two different sizes. You got the six and five eighths, and then you have the five and five eighths. The most popular six and five eighths that you put on top. Now some beekeepers will use this as an entirely. Some people will go all one size and they will raise the brood and the, everything all the way up. It's just lighter, it's easier. I mean, I've seen it, so yes ma'am. Can you explain like how exactly, how the bees use each of these pieces? Because I, I don't understand exactly yet how, which part is okay. the honey that you take. There's a, there's a diagram, the yeah, there's a diagram coming so up. So super is the honey that you That's the term, take. yeah. Mm -hmm. But like I said, some people, because the, the it's being much more friendly on the back, they might run all that and use it for raising the brood area, the, bee, the bees, and using it for supers as well. Now commercial, they're totally opposite. They use the biggest box down, biggest box up, but those guys, you know, they do it for a living and they are younger. <laughs> so and, uh, they, they can lift a 100 pound super off their very like How much would an eight pound, or eight frame one way, full? Of, um, are you talking about this size here? Yeah, like the smaller ones, like if you're trying to keep it lighter weight. Like I, this size know. super here, uh, eight, this size here is 50 pounds. Full. Uh, yeah, full. Eight frame yeah. is approximately 55 pounds. Yeah, it's 50 pounds. Good. But if you ever get stuck in a situation, let's say, God, the box is heavy, or maybe you got back problems or whatever, pull, go frame by frame. You can pull frame by frame to, to add, pull honey. Right. Yeah. You don't have to sit there and lift that whole thing off. Oh, okay. Yeah. But you, well, if you wanted to inspect the brood box, you have to lift you the whole thing. Yes. That. So mm -hmm. you could do it frame by frame, but that's going to add more time. But honey weighs more than the brood. Honey right, weighs right. a lot. Yeah. Right. Yep. Definitely, it starts getting very weighty. Okay, so this is an option. There's uh, pros and cons about this. You'll talk to a beekeeper. And they'll say, I never use excluders. You know, I've talked to other beekeepers, they always use excluders. I always, my preference is a queen excluder. Um, I like metal, it's my preference. As you know, in Florida, and plastic is its own dilemma. Yes, the plastic ones are much, much cheaper, but like I said, it's, it's an option. Some people don't believe in them at all. It's totally an option that is supposed to prevent the queen from going up into the super to lay eggs. But in theory, it, never say never, because you once in a while we'll find a, a queen that manages to get up there. How are you doing? Okay. So anyways, yeah, you'll manage to find that there will be a queen up there. She will get up. It, I, had, I think I had one last year. And I put her back down, and she got back up there like two, three times, a darn little critter. And finally, finally, after I put her down the third time, she managed to stay down. So it's not, never say never. Um, a reason, I like to also use a plastic. I have one in the house. Um, if I catch a swarm, I like to use this to cut it up. You can take a scissors and cut it up. And just say, well, let's go back in time for a minute. Okay. I use these kind of, this size box is a nuke box here. Yeah, it looks like a nuke. I use them in the yard for catching swarms. So let's say I caught a swarm. All right, we're going to try to keep the swarm. I'll cut a piece of that plastic up and I'll tape it across this entrance here and hope that the queen doesn't get out. It's about a 50-50 shot. I mean, the queen can get past it because she is not, um, when she, uh, you catch a swarm, the queen has reduced her weight. She's skinny mini, as they say. So she probably a good chance she'll be 50-50 to get past that. But once she starts getting established and laying eggs, she'll, she'll put the weight back on, she'll pump back up, she won't get past that thing. But I've tried it, it's, it's about 50-50. But that's why I like to use the, the plastic to cut it up. But when it doesn't work, you just go and find the, find the hive empty. Yeah. Gotcha. Or they might jump to another box. Like that oh. hasn't happened before. Sometimes you cannot figure out the logic of a swarm. <laughs> they're, they're very, in, they're fun, but they're very unusual. In, in okay, hi, Liz.
So you're going to see these are popular, the migratory lids and the telescoping lids. And you'll even get the fancy ones. I guess they call this like a garden lid. There's variations of hive lids. Um, I prefer telescoping. Uh, unfortunately, they're expensive. But the reason why I prefer them is migratory don't last. Um, I purchased them. I caulk the seams. You know, you caulk the seams where they butt the wood together. And you paint them and paint them. And every year, I swear, you got to take it back off and you got to do maintenance. I, if I can get that migratory lid the last two years, I'm lucky. I originally still have telescoping lids from eight years that I first purchased as a beekeeper. So to me, they're worth the weight in gold. They just last. Is that metal on top? Yes, that is metal on top. It lasts. Let me, yeah. Um, Angie, yes. On a class yesterday, one of the guys was talking about that telescoping yes. having a lot more holes in it for ventilation. So they have, even, an, they have being, a hole up here. Or even being screened. Yeah. Yeah, there's variations on it. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. if the, you would replace that wooden inner cover yeah. with the screen cover. Yes. Uh, they make a screen cover. Yeah, they do. Is that, is that common for us with the heat? Uh, for ventilation. You can. Yeah. You can change I, it up. I do it. Do it, yeah. I do it. Yeah. But just be careful. Well, don't do not do it during a robbing it. time, though. You you can get it from when you're buying mm -hmm. your cover. You can buy the, say, say, I want a screen inner cover. Yeah. yeah. There's, like I said, you're going to, when you venture into the buying equipment, so many variations. Yeah. It, it about hurts your head. It really yeah. does. I just don't want yeah. to get off on the wrong foot. But just don't put this, <laughs> don't put the screen, don't put that screen cover on if it's robbing. Be careful. Especially if it has this opening if, here. If there's what? It has that opening there. But the trick is if you want to shut the opening, you want to shut that opening, take the lid and shove it to the back. Yeah. That lid moves and you can shove that lid to the back and it will close that opening. Gotcha. There, and I use that, I do that a lot when we're in a dearth of sore here. There is here. no opening on the screen. They take them off the screen? Yeah. Good. Right. Okay. I didn't know I haven't right. purchased them. I have two of those in the shed, but they're not a variation for that. Yeah. What is the the bottom? The bottom is, I think they call this a garden garden thing. It's just a, another fancy type of uh, lid. I'd like to add on that garden. Okay. When I started, I we we got the garden one because it was pretty uh -huh. and so we had two hives together next to each other those aren't practical at all they may look cool and if you only have one hive i use the telescoping because your hive next to you is a table yes you can set your smoker on it you can yep. set things down yeah. on it yep. and that gabled roof or the garden roof is things slide up you can't yeah. set things and sometimes i notice practical. that people that buy these these can be hard to get the lid situated back onto the hive, too. Yeah. They're kind of a little wonky. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, it gets more complicated. <laughs> uh, you can buy assembled or unassembled, painted, not painted, or beads, wax coated. And there are so many variations on hive kits, it's amazing. Um, like I said, you'll be perusing those catalogs or checking out websites, and it's overwhelming. It really is overwhelming. Are there paints we should stay away from? Uh, I just use house paint. Yeah. Just go to the oop, go to the oop section, yeah. at the stores. Outdoor. And use it. Outdoor yeah. house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Outdoor house paint. Yeah. You don't paint the inside. Yeah. Paint the outside. The one thing okay. I don't like. Let's go back. One thing I don't like. And okay, let's say you bought this box and it's painted. Paint this edge right here. Paint the edge of the box on both sides. When it rains in Florida, when it rains in Florida, rain goes sideways a lot. This is a, and make sure that this is real tightly sealed. Paint. Make sure this is all painted tight because this rots. This will be the first spots that will rot on your box if that edge is not painted. They do not. If you buy painted, they don't paint that edge. Paint the edge. It, because you all of a sudden you'll be out there one day and the box is rotting from that from that edge. It you'll be like, yeah. I'm a roofer by trade, and if you guys want to get something that will keep your boxes from rotting out, it's called Henry's, and you can get it at Home Depot. They don't sell it at Lowe's. Is that paint? It's a paint. It's a, it's a 100% polymer. It sticks to anything but plastic. Um, but I'm going to paint my boxes with the Henry's. Because when it rains, it actually bubbles up 
the water just like when you wax your car. That's how that's how water resistant hmm. this stuff is. Home Depot. Home Depot, only Home Depot. They don't sell it at um they don't sell it at Lowe's. Um, but it, Henry's is is wonderful. Your, your box. Do you it's know expensive. anybody? Do you know other beekeepers that use it? I'm going to use it on mine. I okay. Don't, I don't, <laughs> no, I'm just saying yeah. because you know, I think I would read the read what it's composed of because you don't want to be putting something on there that might not be. Yeah. You got to just be careful with that. Okay. Yeah. Because right. it, 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 it dries and, and, just and like a plastic. And if there's something on there that the bees don't like, um, like if it's got a, a lingering something, it might cause an issue. Yeah, just be very, very careful. Okay. Because I don't recognize it. Um, some of the catalogs, if you look through them, some of the companies sell paint for be painting hives. Maybe compare it to what they're selling. <coughs> read, okay. read what they're selling. If you go to like... Man, Lake, and Dedan, I think they both sell stuff that you paint hives with. Compare Henry's to that and see what, what, how those ingredients are. Just be very careful. Okay. Because I don't know what's in Henry's, so. Yeah, so, and Henry's <coughs> can be expensive. Okay. And money is an option. Oaks paint is the cheapest you're going to find. Yeah. They've changed it now. Home Depot is still $9 a gallon. Um, versus $35 a gallon. Um, uh, Lowe's has changed it to 50%, so you're, it's still 30, some of it's $60 a gallon. And I was Oof. like, you gotta be kidding me. But if you wanna choose your colors, you're gonna have to buy it and then mix it, and that's gonna be full price. You're not gonna find white in the books section no. because white is not mixed. You're gonna find a, a shade of whatever color. Yeah, go with light. Go with the lighter color. Go don't the lighter don't color. paint the high dark brown or something. And if you do do the oops, it, get exterior paint. Yes. Exterior. Right. No interior paint. Exterior. It, it, like you're you painting your house paint outside. But it, Treat it, it like that. It will lose its color. Yep. And um, your pretty high will turn chalky, whatever. Yeah. And three coats on the sides. I prime it too. I don't it, believe in the all-in-one primer i kind of never have believed in it so i buy a primer i use exterior primer i paint my eyes with exterior primer and then i put the coats i paint it yep just use a sunny day out there and, and paint your boxes in the yard use does that yep. i use yeah. three coats yeah and a primer. Uh, the, i like I, prim I, 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 prim I, I don't do primer i do three coats of paint okay you can do you can do primer and then two coats right so yeah. that's and but I said I don't believe in the all in one. I just think it's a little right. But that's just my problem. But sometimes that you find the all in one in the oops section, so you've got the all in one. Yeah. You can just make sure it's exterior, like right. you said. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you know that thing people do when they like burn wood? Does that help? What do you mean? To by preserve that? it, like they get they give it like I mean, a burn they on the outside. They scorch it in the inside. Yeah. On the outside, I think. They do it on the outside. Yeah. yeah. It preserves it. Uh, I. Don't really know anything about it. I just know that you can go places to get your boxes dipped in wax. Okay. I've heard that if you get your boxes dipped in wax, they could last 20 years easily. But you gotta, you know, pay to get them dipped, and you gotta find someone who has a dipping tank. So, and I don't know anybody that does. Oh, ding ding. Okay, uh, there you go. There's that diagram that we were talking about. So this is kind of basically, yeah. Now remember, the stand is optional. This is optional, okay? Queen excluder is optional. So this, yeah, you know, I just use the bottom board. That's the entrance reducer we talked about. It usually, well, I can't say that now. They used to sell it when you bought the bottom board. But I think the manufacturers are now selling it separate. So be careful. It might not, your bottom board it might not come with the excluder with it. I think they're starting to separate them. So this usually is where the baby bees are raised in the deep area. But like I said, you can use the upper smaller boxes that they call supers if you don't want to mess with a deep, a deep box. And you can use that and use the same size all the way up and all the way up if you want. Some people do. If you're using a telescoping lid, you need to use the inner cover. If you do not and you put that down, you might not get that lid, that upper outer cover back off. I've been in yards where someone does not use that inner cover. You, it's an act of God to get that pulled back up without that inner cover. That's why make sure if you buy an outer, outer cover, 
You have to get inner. I think they're starting to sell those pieces separate as well. So just be cautious of that. Because the manufacturers or companies are starting to change them all. When you add, when you have to add boxes because you're getting too many bees, mm -hmm. you add another, like, one of the ones on the bottom, below the queen. It depends how you're doing it. If you want room down here for her, you could add another box. Some people, they go above the queen explorer and they try to move the bees up. Because what happens is you, the bees are foraging through here. So they're going through here to get upstairs to put you know, the nectar up there. So it's causing a lot of congestion down here. But if your queen doesn't have any room to lay eggs down here, this is full. There's no room for the queen to lay eggs. It's going to send off a signal for swarming. Oh my gosh, we got to expand. So the bees are going to take it upon themselves. Okay, we're going to swarm now because we don't have any more room down here. So it depends. If you don't have room down here, you got to make room somehow. Either a split, add another box or something. If you don't have room up there, you'll probably, if you run out of room in your super, it's the same thing. If your bees are in a heavy nectar flow and it's, it's going on great and they're filling a box. I've had hives fill a super in three days. It's nothing impossible. Um, I've had a hive have four supers on it, and I got to put two supers on at a time to be able to keep up with that. And I got to check back in three days because I know in less than a week, I got to pull two supers off to extract because I got to try to keep up with this hive. So I've had it happen twice since where I live. I'm hoping it happens again. It's <laughs> awesome, but it's really labor. So if they're running out of room up in the super, it is, it's a nectar flow. So either A, you got to put another box on, and if you don't put another box on, they're going to try to put it down here. Well, this is all we got available. We're going we're gonna to take it and we're going to put it down here, and now what happens? The queen, she runs out of room. Now, her igling area is gone. So what it's going to do, it's going to trigger a swarming thing. Because con con congestion in the hive is a trigger for swarming. Yes? Can you put another deep super on top yes, of it? Yes, you can. Yep. Yep, you can put another one on. Sure can. What's the ideal working height to set up a, a hive? Well, um, commercial guys, they work flat on the ground. I use two cinder blocks, because then the, the hive is up here, right here. It's that tall. I like the two cinder blocks height. I can use it like he said, the, the neighbor hive is a table. I'm not bending over and, and you know. Two cinder blocks on their side, or? Two cinder blocks. Sure. It's back there. Oh. Two cinder blocks like that, laying flat. Okay. Yeah. If they're upright, they get kind of, they'll be moving around too much. Keep the holes accessible. Yes. Because if you're going to use that hole, if a storm comes, you can put a strap through it. And another thing, like you said, if you put those holes, let's say that hole's like that, and you turn that, and the holes are in the middle, and you can't see the holes, Ants like to use that area. They'll burrow under there and then they have access to come up and you, and you can't see what's going on. So yeah, lay your blocks like that where the holes are sideways. Is there anything you do to avoid the ants from climbing up? Well, they some people use, like, they if they have legs, they can put um, these like moats. They make these moats with like mineral oil and they'll drown them on that. I use cinnamon. Ants can't stand cinnamon. If I have an ant, I had last year, because we had rain, I had two hives having problems with ants. And, you know, you can buy cinnamon, you can sprinkle it at the entrance, pull up, I pull up frame one, frame ten, sprinkle it down in the hives, don't, bees don't care, and then the ants, they go away. You can use tangle wood, put it around the, if you have like the four by fours, you can put it around the four by four. What's it called? Tangle foot, tangle foot, or grease. Yeah, yep. Grease. I heard they people Vaseline legs too. Right. Yeah, Vaseline the legs, or mineral oil to make moats. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. You're gonna do the same thing you're doing, put down uh, tenacious earth or cinnamon. Yep. Yeah. But that's something that you're gonna have to keep doing. You, there are. And proof pipe stands for the, the moats. Like yeah, they sell those Which, with the moats. It's mm -hmm. a little more expensive up front, but it's a lot less hassle as you go. Mm -hmm. Any questions about the setup? Go ahead. 
I, I was talking to somebody yesterday, and I don't know anything about a flow hive, but so we, somebody was talking about using a flow hive as a super. Okay. Um, I've done a lot of inspections with the thing. flow. Okay, here, here's the thing with the flows, okay. Um, a lot of people, for some reason, tend to go to them. They're expensive. Don't get me wrong. Flow hives are expensive. The thing I'm finding problems with the flow hives is that the bees do not like to draw, draw the supers. They don't like the wax. And all that cartridge, it's like a cartridge up there in the super area. It's like a cartridge. They don't like the wax. I've had beekeepers that have had flow hives for three years. The bees never move on. And to replace that cartridge is $12 to $14 per frame. They're extremely expensive. While I can go purchase one of these for three, four dollars, and I can get the bees to draw off. Um, to me, I would not go near the, the flow hive. I would never use a flow hive because of the price and the, the problems I'm seeing with bee, beekeepers having them. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna accent. <laughs> yes, okay. When you're buying, when you're purchasing, so say if you want to have two hives. So you buy one super, two honey supers for to start out. Right. How many extras should you purchase? At least have a, a box or two extra. On each because end. there are situations that are going to arise. Maybe maybe something happens and you you're, you have two hives and you're like, man, I need to do a split. Well, if you're going to have to do a split, you got to have equipment to put it in. Um, I keep four to six swarm traps up in my yard. So you might want to put up a swarm trap, you know, just as a preventive, a preventative measure. But there's always good, it, it, it really is horrible if you don't have the piece of equipment, you got to go order it and you got to wait for it. So it's always good to have a, a box or two extra, always. Because there's, there's things that come up. Yep. Telephone. Yes. All yes. Like a, you were talking about even with for the, the brood bomb. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is that mainly they feel like it's lighter? For them? Yes, it's and easier for them. Easy. Yep, they just run all the same so box. Mm -hmm. My neighbor gave me some supplies and they were all supers. And I'm, I wasn't that's sure. That's probably what they were doing. Was, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you could ask them if that's what they're doing. Yeah. yeah she, she just started too. So she just <laughs> opted new as well. It's so, just easier because the brood area is a little bit smaller. The only yeah. thing, if you decide to do that, you're going to have the brood area, you just cut the size down. Right, so you're going to now have, have to have some extra boxes that right. compensate that space. Yeah, exactly. your, your brood box would be two medium supers right. instead of one deep. So two mediums would take the place of yep. one deep. That would be considered your brood box. Okay. Yep. They're, it's lighter, it's easier, but the drawback is you have double the frames to look yeah, through. Not, oh yeah, not so even. now you have 20, if you have a 10 frame, you have 20 frames looking for the queen or checking the brood or whatever instead of a 10. It's more tedious and, than it, can, it, yeah. but there's, there's But some people like it that way, so it's all it's it's all preference. I know many people that love it. And so yep. I mentioned it yesterday that that makes all your frames in the chain. Yes. Today. Yes, the parts are all changeable. Like I said, the commercials they use all deeps. That's why they like it. They don't. They don't mess with different size boxes. They just commercial guys use all all nine and five eighths deeps for whether it's super or or not. But they don't. They don't deep, mess with different boxes. Can you put a deep on the bottom and then mediums up top? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. But it, you can't do a ten frame and eight frame. So no, they all have to be eight. Because eight. the boxes the boxes are different widths. Okay. So I have never seen a small box. I've seen the deep, I, I have a deep, I've done the deep, but yeah. the small. When would you use a small? Why would you use a most small? Most people, you very rarely, and most places don't even sell that not, that right. five and five eights. Right. No. Right, that's... Uh, I mean, it's, it's most catalogs don't sell it. It's just a weird little box. And the only bad part is, man, you're gonna to have to have extra boxes because they're gonna fill that. They're gonna fill that up even faster if it's a nectar flow. That's what I have. They're, they're no, you, those are mediums. Those are uh, the mediums, six and five eighths, which are yes. Yeah. But that's I've been doing it four years. I have never seen a small. I've seen no, I've catalog. never seen a beekeeper using them. I, so I'm not sure why they're, they're selling. Always put them in the description of a hive. You got the small box, and it's like never used, never seen. Yep. Never, I don't know. And realize that all the frames. 
You know, even if you bought those two different sizes, that frame ain't going to fit over there, and that frame ain't going to work over there. Right. So, it will, I mean, if you took that 6 and 5 eighths, you put that 5 and 5 eighths frame into the 6 and 5 eighths, you're going to have that gap. The bees are going to take advantage of that, and you're going to have a mess of comb under, on the bottom. So, it's not recommended to do that, to interchange them. About how long would someone spend inspecting a hive? How much time? Depends what you're doing. If you're just going in there to check and see if they have uh, stores, which I call nectar and pollen, and, and you can quickly look for eggs. You don't have to find the queen. You can just look for eggs or very, very, very tiny hive. Now, I can check a hive in five, five minutes. So this, it depends what you're doing. When you first start out, it takes it's a while. It's, it's yes. Take it's about awkward. About it's hour, awkward. Hour or two because yeah. you don't know what you're doing. No. You're scared you're going to crush bees. Yep. You're taking your You get time faster. And, yep. But once you get it down, you can do it in five minutes. Yeah. But expect it's not going to be easy when you first start. No. You, you're but, awkward. You're afraid you're going to crush a bee. Um, you're going to be kind of clumpy. You know, you might bump a frames and all that but yeah you'll be awkward and it can go faster if you have a mentor with you yeah a mentor can help get you through it but if you're by yourself it can take a while okay so b gear b gear is based on your comfort level um you'll see guys just wearing a veil and a long sleeve shirt um i've actually done an inspection the guy had on a sun hat tank tops and shorts no veil nothing and flip-flops so, um, but his bees were extremely, extremely nice. And he ran 75 hives, and he was doing it for years. So it's gonna be based on your comfort level. Um, I now use gloves. I can't handle the stings on my hands anymore because they just pull me through the ceiling. But um, it's gonna all, you know, based on your comfort level, but you're gonna need some kind of protection, jacket, veil, or suit, if you wanna use gloves. A smoker, you definitely need a smoker and a hive tool to work a hive. Definitely. And there are variations. There's and variations. There's vendors down there that are giving away the hive tools because it has the logo. Yeah. Yeah. So here's the veils. Yeah. Well, no, it's there. They're giving away some of the vendors down the hallways. And there, like you said, there's variations on veils. Yep. So you have these kinds here. Different kinds of hats, different kinds of, um, you know, different types of veils. Is there one that works best for South Florida here? Ventilated. <laughs> Something ventilated. <laughs> that one might not be too bad. That one on the right would be, out of those, would be the best one. Or yeah. the most comfortable. And then there's the, 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 the jackets and suits. And they do sell ventilated. You know, they're kind of pricey, but ventilated is the way to go. Yeah. So it depends on your comfort level, like I said. Um, there's different types. They call that, they call the top of that thing there, they call that a fencing, a fencing <coughs> veil on there. Why you can purchase that suit with this type here. Now, I've been in commercial a lot, and I, I'm getting to the point I don't like this. Because the fencing veil, they're now making and they're hanging down so far. Because they're meant for a guy working like this, right? Yeah. So he's working like this. So if I'm looking and I and the fin it's hanging down and I can't see, and I yeah. move that veil back, Angie always moves it back too far and I get hit in the face with yeah. you know. So I made them now change into the round one. Yeah. And I like the round one better. It's nice to you know, so I think for that one they recommend wearing like a ball cap or something that will keep that veil from getting against your skin and right. getting stung. Because you know? I always go like that. And, yeah. Go ahead. So with the fencing veil, it can be hotter. But if you're if you're just working your hives, you don't need the fencing veil. If you're going to be doing a cutout or if you're going to be getting a swarm out of a tree, the fencing veil works better because it's not as big, um, you don't have as much surface another area. bad thing about the fencing veil I just remembered it now some of them you have to wear a baseball cap yeah. with it <laughs> so if you're wearing it if you're wearing a fence he has a cap he has, right. you can see it on the edge there right there he has a cap on so those fencing veils you've got to wear a baseball cap yeah to, to with the rim so it holds that out but one or you can take a string or you can take it and, and tie those two two um, screens together and tie it together. Some of the guys tie it as well. 
Because then it ain't so ungodly droopy. One pro on the fencing bill, they do make a zipper now. It, yeah, there's it, some that do that. So you can get a drink of water. You can take a drink of water. Yeah, but can, you can just drink right through the screen. We do that all the time when we're out there. Um, just, you know, it's running, right. but it works. But if you're just working your hives, I would suggest the, what I don't know what they call that, the round. That, I think it's just called the round veil. The round veil. Yep. Because it's a lot cooler than the. So then they have different types of gloves, and this is all on preference. They have canvas, goat skin, cowhide. And of course, there are ventilated and non-ventilated gloves. What do you use? Because you I'm using goat sensitive. skin. Yeah, yeah. Because it's a trade-off of you know being nimble and. I'm th I'm thinking about trying the canvas, just to just for the fun. Of it. Cowhide is course is pricey, and there's not a lot of companies that sell it. It's kind of a you got to search for it if you're going to go that route. If you get and there are if you get a chance down here and try some gloves on to find the size you need. Because if you're gonna buy online, you buy online. Oh, but you, if there. you get them too big, then you're, you're yeah. given a, you need them to fit as nicely as possible. I wear extra small, and they're big on me. I'm even thinking about buying the kids' size, because they sell kids' gloves. <laughs> and the extra small are this, this much bigger than, I mean, it's amazing. Wow. So yeah, like you said, try on the gloves before you buy. You get the that, chair. There's not. different they, they, high they, tools. If they have them. Got them. Try it. So there's different types of hive tools. My favorite is this, J frame. It's just my favorite. Uh, most people down. use this. This is probably the one that we're giving away downstairs. And this one here, very interesting. There were there were some of the ones you like down there too. Yeah. They're giving away. Yeah. I like the J frame. It's my preference because you can use that little that little hook there. You hook it in the corner. Let me go back. Here we go. So you hook it in the corner here, in this corner here, and you use and you just put the frame down, and it lifts the frame right up. Okay. It uses like a torque, you know. It yeah. kind of just magic. Yeah. So it's my it's my favorite. It, it's what I like. The other one that's flatter, you got to use an edge. When it comes flat to one like this, you got to use the edge to to pick it up. So. Do you wash the gear, like the sorry the veil and stuff? Does that stuff get washed? Yeah, you can. Um, hand, you have to hand wash the veil. Don't put it in the machine. I don't put my bee equipment in the machine anyways because I don't want it. That's but uh, here, like bees don't like perfumes and things. So is, right. is there a particular detergent or something? No, I just use um, I use dish soap, a little palm mallet. I'm strange. I'm old school. I use a five gallon bucket in the yard. Take the hose. I drop a little palm mallet. Palm mallet. Just soap in the bucket, fill it up with some soap, take my bee jacket in, scrub it old school, let it sit and soak and all that. Throw it on the back of the patio chair, take the hose, hose it down, let it sit in the sun, dry, I'm done. I just don't want to have the honey and the propolis and all that in my machine, you know, because, you know, being in the bee yard and I, Somehow I end up with stuff on my clothes. <laughs> so yeah, I yeah. wash mine out in the yard in a five gallon bucket. <laughs> so I really go old school, but it works for me. Yep. Okay, I have got to bring this out and I know you've already seen this before. So when you purchase a smoker, and I run into this more times than I ever want to count. Some of the some companies sell, it comes separate. This is not attached. So be aware of that. If you look down your smoker, if you see this piece coming separate and it's flopping around and it's not attached, you had purchased one of those kinds of smoker. Um, I had Googled this. It has more names than life itself. As you can see, it's called a smoker tray, a smoker grate, a bracket, a breather plate, and a cigarette holder. These are more European names. The United States uses these two names here. So if you're one of those people that ends up with one of these discs in there, and um, like I said, I've only, I've probably over 100 inspections I've done in the backyard. I've only had one or two people get it correct. So you're going to get that flat disc, and I, I brought one in because I have smokers like that. So it's going to come flat, right? You got this flat piece here. You're going to bend these little legs. Bend, okay? And what you're going to do is you're trying to get this here. There's an air valve, there's air that comes through the back of the smoker chamber, right? So you want that disc to sit up here above. You're creating like a charcoal grill. Yeah. You want that flow to go through there up. Because if this is thrown in there and it's sitting down upside down or that, 
I get a lot of people, oh my God, my smoker won't stay lit. Because now all your fuel is sitting flat down on, down on the bottom of the smoker. And you might have to adjust this a little bit, you know, because these are very bendable. But just go ahead and bend that. And then you set that down in there like that. It's like a little table. Put your fuel on top. And then, you, you know, you're ready to go. But just be aware, if you end up with one like that, that that's what they're for. Um, I don't like it. The companies do not come with instructions with this. And I'm thinking about writing all the companies like, hey, can you like put a little something in there, let the people know? But I run into this a lot. A lot of beekeepers are like, my smoker won't stay lit. But that is uh, what that is, that the little piece right there. Okay, you got lucky, you got uh, a super full of honey. All right, now we're rolling, boys. Somehow you, you made it through and you got, you know, you got some honey to extract. So actually the cheapest way to extract is you're going to get, and the company sell this here, these are three filters and you can choose which one you like. I've tried, there's usually a 200 micron filter, 400 micron filter, and a 600. I've tried all three just to see my preference. I like 400. 400 leaves a little bit of pollen in there, you know, because I have allergy problems. And I, I like how the texture is in that. So you can experiment. They usually sell that with a, a five gallon bucket with a honey grade. Um, some people unfortunately go to big box stores to purchase that. Make sure it's food grade. Make sure it's a food grade bucket that you're gonna use, okay? So the old fashioned method, if you wanna go and you got a super full of honey and you're happy as a clam, you, buy, you get yourself a bee brush and you go out to and pull that frame off. So you're gonna pull that frame off. I, I do it this way. This is how um, I pull it off, grab my frame, and I take those bees and I put that frame in front of the hive, sweep it down. Sweep, sweep, sweep. You sweep the bees off that frame. And the bees will fall on the ground and then they start heading up the entrance. You know, you just plop them down near there and then they'll head up. <coughs> so you start doing that and you go frame by frame. I take a separate box in the yard. I have a, a garden cart and I'll take that, pe that frame now, put it in that separate box and put a lid over it. Because I don't want the bees, the bees are all going to be smelling that honey. Oh boy, they know when it's honey time. So then I'll create a, put a separate lid on there and I'll start frame by frame, sweep, drop it down, put it in the separate box and I'll take it off. And then I'll go through and grab whatever I need. So the crush and strain method is this basically what you need for crush and strain, which is the cheapest method. I should have put that on there. Um, what you see on there is there's a foundation. You pull up the frame, there's a foundation on there. People take a spatula type thing and you scrape scrape all the wax down and you're going to sit, set it down in that filter you're scraping going into that filter and then some people they'll put on the, the gloves and they'll and they'll squeeze it all that or you could take a fork and kind of mash it and all the honey is going to drain down into your bucket there and then what you do is you can set that bucket up and then later on after it's all run down you open up the gate and you fill up your jars but the downfall about the crush and strain it is the cheapest but it, it's the longest, because now what happened, you took all the wax, all the wax is off the frames now. And yeah, I, I put the supers back on, I believe, I'm a believer, put them back on, let the bees clean it up. But I don't do this method, I did when I first started beekeeping. So now, the bees have to recreate all that wax. <laughs> they got to spend a lot of collecting nectar and all that. It, it costs resources to create all that wax. So now they got to rebuild all the comb back on those frames before they can even put it in for nectar and then now dry it down and create honey. So that's the downfall of having ha, doing this method. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but just realize that it's going to delay your next when your next nectar flow comes. So if you decide not to do that, there are many variations of extractors. Many. Some of them are electric. Some of them are hand crank. 